Hello everyone. This video is going to be the first in a series that talks about the major forms of contamination in aviation fuel. Now specifically, we're going to be talking about jet fuel, but with avgas, things are going to be pretty similar. There may be some subtle differences or maybe even some things that don't apply. Now the entire mission and purpose of Fuel QC is to control and mitigate contamination. Our equipment, the filters, and our daily routines are all centered around contamination. Now, no fuel system is perfect, and just because the fuel was clean when it arrived at your facility doesn't mean it's going to stay clean all the way to the wingtip. Tanks are vented. We don't control the air or what's carried in the air, and we can't see inside the filter vessels and the tanks or the hoses, or at least on a daily basis. So there are certain things that we can't see or control that can lead to contamination. Now, there are five major forms of contamination. There's water, particulate, microbiological, surfactant or surface active agent, and product mixing. Some of these forms of contamination are related or can lead to each other, which creates sort of a negative feedback loop. Now, for each form of contamination, I'm gonna cover six points. Number one is gonna be the type, or what do we call it? Number two is gonna be the vector. Where does it come from? Number three is gonna be the threat. Why is it bad? Four is gonna be detection. Where in the system are we gonna be looking for it and at what frequency? Number five is going to be parameters. There may be some acceptable limits to some forms of contamination. And number six is going to be strategies. How do we fight it on a daily basis? And what do we do when the contamination does cross that threshold where it's no longer acceptable? Before I really dive into the topic, I want to talk about a few things that uh, I've either heard around the industry or maybe some misconceptions or maybe even some things that I used to believe. Uh, one of them is, hey, my tanks are brand new. I shouldn't have any problems. And that may be true because as things get older, problems tend to come up a lot faster or in higher quantity. Uh, but the fact is, if you have brand new fuel tanks and brand new equipment, if you move fuel into them and you do nothing, the fuel will still become contaminated. It's just kind of the way it works. Uh, the only real analog that I can make is like dusting around your house. Just because you dusted a week ago doesn't mean there won't be any dust in there today. And if you don't take care of it, it can eventually lead to other bigger problems. Um, and another one is, you know, man, the fuel is filtered so many times before it reaches the airplane. There just shouldn't be any problems. And the fuel is filtered many, many times between the refinery and the wingtip. Um, but filtration doesn't necessarily work in compounding terms. It's not like the fuel is getting cleaner and cleaner and cleaner every time it moves through filtration. Now there are different forms of contamination that are more likely to occur at different stages on the fuel's lifespan, and there's gonna be different forms of filtration placed at those different points. Um, but every time the fuel moves, it's coming into a new environment and every new environment is a new opportunity for the fuel to be contaminated. And it may have been uh, filtered and moved into a completely clean brand new tank, but it had to move through a pipe that maybe wasn't maintained as well. Or it's moving from a pipe into a hose that is at the end of its service life and is starting to break down. So every stage along the lifespan is a new opportunity for the fuel to become contaminated. Now the first major form of contamination I wanna talk about is water. Water is by far the most common form of contamination and you will see it in the fuels. Now jet fuel is an oil product and oil and water don't mix, right? Well, I'm not a chemist, so I'm not gonna go into any detail about chemistry, but oil and water don't mix because of polarity and surface tension. Now surface tension can be measured and tested in a laboratory setting using a microseparometer or an MSEP test. It's not something that's commonly available to FBOs. But if that surface tension is degraded, potentially by a surface active agent, which is another form of contamination, it reduces the ability of that fuel to separate itself from the water molecules. Now I wanna talk about two different forms of water in fuel. You have dissolved water and free water. Now dissolved water, which is also called water in solution, Jet fuel actually has the ability to carry some amounts of water at a molecular level, and the amount of water that it can carry is typically tied directly to temperature. As a general rule, the higher the temperature, the higher the amount of water molecules that the jet fuel can actually carry. Now, what's commonly accepted across the industry, 
that dissolved water is not considered to be contamination. It can't be removed by any conventional means and it can't even be detected by any means that are commonly available to line service or FBOs. So dissolved water is not considered to be contamination. Free water, on the other hand, is considered to be a problem because that is water that has separated from the fuel but is maybe moving along with it. So you have that liquid on top of a liquid or you may have some larger water droplets that are intermixed with the fuel that are moving wherever the fuel moves. That is considered to be a problem. Now, when it comes to fuel QC, we are talking specifically about free water. We detect free water, we have limits for free water, and we protect against free water. Now, within free water, there's another form that's also called emulsified or entrained water. These are fine water droplets that have started to separate from the fuel, they're no longer dissolved, but they may not be large enough or heavy enough to completely separate from the fuel, but they are visually detectable, which makes the fuel to appear to be cloudy or hazy. Again, this is a form of free water contamination and is considered to be a problem. So what's the vector for water contamination? Where does it come from? It comes from a lot of different places. First of all, jet fuel is a petroleum product. It's pulled out of the earth. The earth is 70% water. And like I said, with dissolved water, there's always gonna be a certain amount of water that is in the fuel. You just can't get all of it out. Um, but also a lot of the water contamination is gonna come from the air and not just in the form of rain or snow, but also humidity. Now specifically, it's going to access the fuel through the vents in the tanks. Storage tanks and uh, truck tanks, they all have to be vented. And so anything that's carried in the air is gonna go right into it and into the fuel. Now, when you move fuel out of a tank, that volume is going to be replaced by air. And there may be temperature differentials. It may be warm in one area and cool in the other, and there's going to be an exchange of air between those two zones. And anything that's in the air is going to go right with it. And fuel tanks are allowed to be cleaned with water. They may be drained of all their fuel and then blasted with uh, steam or high pressure water in order to clean that tank. And sometimes not all of that water is removed from the tank before it's returned to service. So the threat, why is water contamination bad? Well, first of all, water doesn't burn and fuel in an engine needs to combust and provide thrust, so it needs to burn. Specifically with aircraft, when they go up to high altitude and extreme low temperatures, that water that may be present in the fuel is obviously going to freeze. And so any ice crystals that form in the fuel system they can clog up fuel lines, they can clog fuel filters, and there have been aircraft that have crashed because ice crystals formed in the fuel system and starved the engine of fuel. Water can also lead to other forms of contamination. Uh, when water sits long enough, things will start to rust, which leads to microbiological contamination, and that rust can eventually start to deform and lift off um, paint coatings or epoxy coatings in tanks, which now leads to particulate contamination. Now you have solid objects that are floating in the fuel and have to get caught by filters or screens or things like that. And also, if you leave water sitting long enough, eventually things are going to start growing in it may not be specifically rust, but there's gonna be other forms of microbiological contamination. So detection, where should we go to look for water contamination and how often or at what frequency? Now under most circumstances, water is gonna be detected visually. You should be able to see it. And this is something that we do every single day with our white buckets. On every piece of fueling equipment, whether it's a fuel truck or a tank, um, we're going to be taking samples from that, from that tank and from the filter attached to that tank. And water is heavier than fuel, so when you take that sample, the water should be at the bottom of that container. Now with entrained or emulsified water, it may appear to be cloudy or hazy, and again, that's going to be based on the temperature. Beyond taking daily sump samples, there are testing kits specific for detecting free water. And according to ATA 103, you are required to use a free water kit every single month. And that has to be taken downstream of filtration. Now there are a lot of places along the system to take samples, but you are required for the monthly free water check to take a sample downstream of filtration. And that's just to make sure that your program and your filters are actually doing their job of removing as much free water as possible. Now there's two main places to take a sample downstream of filtration. Number one is gonna be a millipore uh, sampling port 
So whenever you do a millipore test and you draw that fuel into a bucket, whether it's one gallon, three gallons, or whatever it is, that fuel is downstream of the filter and you can use that fuel to do your free water test. Another great location for a free water test is out of the overwing nozzle. What comes out of that overwing nozzle is the absolute product of your complete fuel QC program. That represents what is actually going into aircraft. So you can bring a white bucket and shoot a gallon out of that nozzle into that bucket and use that fuel to do your free water check. So next is the parameters. Now we know when and where to look for it and we may have found some, but is there an acceptable limit Actually, there is. According to the latest revision of ATA 103, the acceptable limit of free water in jet fuel downstream of filtration is 30 parts per million. Now, here's where it gets interesting. Our primary detection method for free water is visual. We just look at it in the bucket. The acceptable limit is 30 parts per million, but at certain temperatures, water may not be visually detectable until it reaches 40 parts per million. So you might be looking at a sample that is completely clear, bright, and sparkly in 1A, but there's still, it still may have a free water content that is higher than the acceptable limit. So the bottom line is, if you see water in a fuel sample, it is already far beyond the acceptable limit. And specifically, where the, the free water lies in that fuel and, wh and where it is a, a, in comparison to the limit, that's where the testing kits come in. And they all kind of work on the same basic principle. A sample of fuel is exposed to a chemically sensitive powder or a paste or something like that, and it's probably going to change color and you compare that color to a chart or a standard. Um, hydro kits, they graduate on a red scale, so they go from white to pink to red. Um, shell water kits go from green to yellow or yellow to green. Aqua glow kits, they uh, glow under UV, and aqua glow kits actually work a little bit differently. Um, but all these kits, they, they all work on the same principle. You expose the, uh, a chemical to the fuel and any water in that fuel is gonna change, it's gonna change the color on that chemical. Now, most of those kits are gonna work on a qualitative scale. As in like the hydro kits go from, like I said, from white to pink to red, and you take that powder and you have to compare it to a color chart and that color chart's gonna tell you where it is on the scale and is it acceptable or not. Problem with that is you're interpreting it with your eyes and some people's vision may be better than others, lighting conditions. Um, it's a qualitative result and it's open to interpretation. Aqua Glow kits, on the other hand, they actually give you a quantitative result and they'll actually spit out a pretty precise number of exactly how many parts per million are in that particular sample of fuel. Now each testing kit has its pros and cons based on how simple it is to use or some of it's based on price. Like I said, the Aqua Glow uh, takes some of the guesswork out of it, but they are um, extremely expensive and difficult to use. I've actually never seen an Aqua Glow kit in use at FBOs. The two most common kits I've seen at the FBO level is gonna be hydro kits and shell water kits. Now something important about all of these testing kits is that they have expiration dates. And that's because eventually, that, chemically, that water sensitive chemical or powder is gonna eventually get enough exposure to the ambient air and the humidity in that air that it's gonna start giving you a result for the ambient air instead of the water that may be present in the fuel. So it's gonna give you an erroneous result. Um, the hydro kits, they're a vacuum sealed tube, but no vacuum is completely perfect. And eventually there is gonna be ambient air that gets in there and affects that water sensitive powder that's in there. And with hydro kits specifically, I've heard a lot of stories about uh, hydro kits being used and you know that needle punctures the, the diaphragm and the, the air and the fuel goes into that tube, it changes color and a guy will do the test and it's an acceptable passing grade and he leaves it on the manager's desk and the manager comes in on Monday morning and it's now completely red and people start freaking out. And that's just because eventually enough air got in there that the humidity in the air eventually started to affect that test powder. And it's not a representation of the fuel sample itself. And so you have to be pretty careful and understand what you're working with when it comes to some of these kits. Shell water kits are, are kind of the same way. If they sit on a shelf long enough, they're gonna get enough exposure to the ambient air that the humidity is gonna change the color of that disc before it's ever used on a fuel sample. In addition to the free water testing kits, there's also water finding paste that's available. 
and they are in use at a lot of different operations, but it serves a little bit of a different purpose. Water detection paste is typically used in storage tanks to detect bulk amounts of water at the bottom of the tank. And it works on the same principle. It changes color once it's exposed to water, uh, but it doesn't give you any sort of graduated result. So it doesn't tell you um, where it is on the scale. Is it acceptable or is it not? It's very binary. It'll just tell you there's no water or there is water. So the typical application for water finding paste is to apply it to a measuring stick, which a lot of operations do once a month uh, when they're uh, calibrating against their Vita root system or their clock gauges, or they may be taking daily inventory with a measuring stick. Um, but whenever they do that, they will apply the water, water sensitive paste to the bottom of the stick um, so they can get their fuel measurement and they can also see if there is any water at the bottom of the tank. And if so, how high up does that water go? Again, it's not typically used for a free water test because it doesn't give you a precise enough result to tell you if the amount of water is acceptable or not. It'll just tell you if it's there and how high up does it go. So there is water finding paste out there, but it has a different application and it's not typically used to satisfy that monthly ATA 103 free water check requirement. So this leads us to strategies. So what do we do to fight or protect ourselves against it? And what do we do when it actually surpasses that acceptable limit? There's a lot of design features that do a lot of the work for us. Um, for example, um, storage tanks. Horizontal storage tanks are, are supposed to be set on a slope so that any fuel runs down to a common collection point. All storage tanks have to have sumps to make water removal uh, much, much easier. Um, coalescer filter vessels, for example. In a horizontal um, arrangement, the upstream fuel or the pre-filtered fuel typically comes in at the bottom and then it goes through filtration. Again, water is heavier than fuel, so the water is going to make its way down to the bottom. And then the downstream or the post-filtered fuel is going to come out of the top of a coalescer filter vessel. Um, so those are some, de some design features that help make our job a little bit easier. So what do we do once it actually surpasses that acceptable limit? If you're taking sump samples and you get a free water result, if you conceive free water in the fuel sample, that means you just need to keep taking samples until you, until you get uh, good clean fuel. And once it surpasses a certain threshold, then you need to start investigating things. And if you have a downstream filtration, like a free water check, that it surpasses 30 parts per million when you do that monthly free water check, that may be an indication that your filter vessel is not doing its job. The filter elements inside may need to be changed. So that covers water contamination. Again, this is gonna be the first video in a series of videos about common fuel contamination problems and another video that I plan on doing about aviation filtration. So be on the lookout for that. Thank you for watching. Again, please feel free to reach out to me if you have any questions. You could find me at my website, maxqfuel.com, here on YouTube, I'm very active on LinkedIn and maybe I'll even meet some of you in person at Schedulers and Dispatchers in San Diego. Uh, thank you again. Be safe, be smart, and it's always okay to stop and ask questions.